Thank you, Brother Ralph, and good afternoon, everyone. And uh, good to have us together around the Word of God. Uh, there's always a message uh, that we can take uh, from the Scriptures, and we're opening uh, at a very, very important, integral uh, part, which we would call the seedbed of the Bible, the book of Genesis, uh, where everything begins, where all the uh, little seeds that are planted here are going to grow into great stories and uh, great teachings from the scripture. It all starts here in Genesis. Were Adam and Eve real people? The Bible says they were. The Bible says this isn't just fables or fairy tales or figurative, that they were real. And the teaching about Adam and Eve isn't just confined to the Old Testament and the book of Genesis or other parts of the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus says they were real. So if we're going to believe our Bible and if we're going to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can't just take one little part and say, well, that's you know, not real. Uh, but this part might be real. The Bible as a whole, we're told, is given by inspiration of God. And we as Christadelphians certainly believe that every part of the Bible is inspired by God. Every little bit of teaching is inspired by God. Jesus says, Adam and Eve were real. God made them in the beginning. So this is what we've just read. Let's have a look over in Matthew chapter 19, where Jesus confirms, as he does also elsewhere. But let's look at Matthew chapter 19 and verse 4. And the context is really uh, quite interesting because uh, it's all about how God established family life in the beginning. And so uh, from the beginning, uh, Jesus says God made them. He made them male and female. He made them to be married and to produce a family. As he said, be fruitful and multiply. Matthew chapter 19 from verse 4. Jesus is answering a question put to him about uh, a man putting away his wife. Jesus says, no, no. He answered and said unto them, Have ye not read, Matthew 19 verse 4, that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. We just read that in Genesis 2. Male and female created by God in the manner that's laid out there. And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Didn't you read that? Don't you know that? Of course, the uh, Jewish elders certainly knew that. They knew their Bibles. And they knew that it was the inspired word of God. So Jesus says, Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. After all, they were created out of one flesh. The woman came out of the flesh of the man. And so they're intended to be one flesh. In marriage, joined together, he says, they're no more twain but one flesh, therefore what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So Jesus' teaching is very clear. God made them at the beginning, he made a male and a female. Now if we go back to Genesis chapter 1, we read where that took place on the sixth day of the creation. <coughs> and uh, the Bible is quite clear, the uh, world as we know it, was created in six days and on the sixth day toward the end of the sixth day man was created and then the woman <coughs> so in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 we read God said let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the flesh fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth now, when the uh, record tells us there, the scripture tells us there in uh, verse 26 that God said, let us make man in our image, we also have to uh, consider other parts of the scripture to understand that this is actually the Elohim, as the original Hebrew word is for God, the Elohim, the mighty ones. And these are the angels as manifestations of God who are making man in their image, which is the image of God, the image of God himself. We are the image of God after the likeness of God. And so uh, the word image uh, does have the idea, the concept of bodily shape, physical image, physically looking like God, as we do, and as the angels do. And we 
Our hope is to be made equal unto the angels, to be just like the angels. The angels have appeared at times through the scriptures in uh, looking just, just like us, just like us, only able to be, show themselves forward as more glorious because they are immortal. God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The word likeness has the idea of the mental capacity, the character, the moral capacity of the man that's created. So the physical and the moral part of men and women are each in the way that God desired, like himself. Able to feel and think as God does, although of course he does it perfectly, and we in our present state can't do that perfectly. Uh, The angels themselves are perfected, uh, having been through a process to bring them to perfection, maybe perhaps like our own process that uh, is here in our Bibles. So the purpose of God is to, having made the man in the, uh, uh, in the image and likeness of himself, uh, through the work of the angels, God created, verse 27, man in his own image, in the image of God, created he him, male and female created he them, which gives us to understand that this all happened on the sixth day. And so in verse 28 we read that God blessed them, And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Fill the earth with people and subdue it. Bring it under your uh, dominion. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Unfortunately, we don't have dominion over all of those things at the moment. But that was God's purpose. To fill the earth with people who were of his image, looked like him, and felt and thought like him, the likeness and having control over the whole world to bring glory to God. That's the whole purpose of God, as we see in a number of passages in the scripture. All the earth will be filled with the glory of God. doesn't happen yet. There's lots of glory around us, lots of beautiful things around us as part of this great creation, but yet there is greater glory to come. So that was the purpose of God, to fill the earth with people who reflected his character and who... Uh, took control of his world and brought glory to him. And in verse 31, we read about the things that God made. They were all appropriate to his purpose. And we read in verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Very good for God's intent. But he had a plan and a purpose that he was going to produce People who really, from their hearts, showed a love for him and an appreciation for him and an honour to the God who had created them. So very good is a term which we could say speaks of the fact that everything was made exactly right for the purpose that God had in mind. Giving them a a body and giving them a mind and a a disposition which could choose to honour him and bring him glory. That's the purpose he had in mind. Physically, the man and the woman are neither mortal, they're not subject to death, they're not going to die as part of the process that uh, he made them with, but they're also not immortal. They're not going to live forever. They're in a kind of in-between state. A time of Trial, probation is going to happen so that God could see whether they developed in their hearts and minds the kind of person that he wanted them to be. So they're neither mortal nor immortal. They're very good. They're in excellent working order. Everything about them is in excellent working order. They're eating fruit from the trees. They've got satisfying jobs to do around the garden, to dress it and to keep it, we read. Uh, they're mature adults who were never children interesting isn't it mature adults never were children never had that experience of of childhood and growing up and so uh, uh, they're in this wonderful environment no thorns or thistles to scratch their bare skin Uh, naked uh, they didn't know they were naked because they didn't know anything else Friendly animals all around them, a fresh, beautiful creation, wonderful environment in the very best part of the world, the Garden of Eden. 
So in Genesis 2 verse 15 we read that the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to dress it and to keep it. Uh, To dress it actually means to till it. To till it. Which would mean that uh, they would loosen up the soil from time to time so the trees would grow uh, fruit nicely and uh, uh, that uh, was a a job they had to do. Um, In in this beautiful garden probably included uh, trimming the hedges, uh, maybe a bit of topiary so they could uh, create some uh, interesting animal shapes in the hedges. Uh, That's the sort of thing that uh, would have been a very satisfying thing for them to do. Pruning and shaping the trees for beauty beauty and for fruitfulness so that they bring forth more fruit and that would require some initiative, some creativity and they would learn the processes of gardening from the angels who came to visit them regularly. Then they're also to keep the garden and to keep the garden it, it means to protect it, to guard it, to protect it. Why would they need to protect the garden? Well, interesting question. We wouldn't want, uh, say, for example, to let an elephant loose in our nice, uh, fresh front garden, would we? Uh, And there might well have been larger herbivorous creatures. You know, the uh, vegetarian dinosaurs uh, may have wanted to put their necks over the fence, but uh, they had to address it and to keep the garden, to guard the garden as guardians they, they were to have dominion over the creatures that weren't compatible, compatible with life in this particular garden. So their role would see them spending their time in the, mainly in the outer perimeter of, of the garden. Uh, and uh, as we said, protecting or guarding that. And the two most important trees were there in the midst of the garden. In the midst of the garden, they didn't go to just yet. Um, Genesis 2 verse 9 says that uh, uh, out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden now that's a phrase that re- reoccurs in chapter 3 in the middle area of the garden is the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so the two most important trees are there in the midst they're spending their time generally around the perimeter as guards and also as um, caring and pruning and so on. Now, in verse 16 and 17, God just gives them one rule. And it's a simple rule, but it's a test. And it's going to prove to be a test, not because they decide individually and personally to test it, but because there is an external temptation going to come. Genesis 2 verse 16, God says, everything's terrific, but there's just one thing I don't want you to do. Verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, so that was their food, fruit from the trees, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And what we find as that works out, as we shall see, is that that means you become a dying creature. Death is a certainty for you. It's going to take 930 years in the case of Adam, but you are going to die. Death will set into your bones. It'll become a part of you. So, the just one rule. And uh, that rule is given to the man before the woman is actually created from him. So it's given to the man who had the responsibility to educate his wife. So Eve didn't hear this directly. Man, the Adam, is given that command. And uh, right from the very beginning, the man is to be the teacher, the leader, the educator, the spiritual head of the household. And he's to tell his wife what the rule is. So, verse 18, it's not good the man should be alone. We're going to uh, make a woman. And we know how that took place. It's all described there. And uh, quite logical that it should be that way. And it's the only creature. She is the only creature who wasn't made directly from the dust of the ground. And so she's intended to be very close to the man and to become his wife and they two to be one flesh. 
as verse 24 tells us. So, God had given them this command to Adam. He talks to Eve, and from what Eve tells us, actually tells the, the serpent in chapter 3, they had made a pact between themselves, Adam and Eve, that they wouldn't touch that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, let alone eat of it. They wouldn't touch it. But it seems as though they wouldn't even go near it. Because the first time she sees the tree is when the servant takes her to the midst of the garden and says, have a look at that tree, will you? All right, doesn't that look wonderful? Well, so their idea was, let's not touch it, let's not even look at it, and then we will not have any problems with that tree. But God created his creatures with free will. Adam and Eve are given free will. And we also have got free will, haven't we? We can decide. Are we going to serve God? Are we going to honour God? Are we going to believe what he says? Are we going to uh, totally and utterly follow his ways? And do we truly believe what he has promised? In this case, he's promised death. Do we truly believe that he's promised us a hope of life? Well, we'll talk more about that shortly, but they've got free will. They can decide. And the reason, of course, that God has created in that way is that it brings forth much more glory to him if they make a free will choice to serve him because they are responding to his goodness, the wonder of the glory that is around them, the great creation, the things that he has done for them. So we, we all have the right to choose. Will we serve God? Will we obey him, honour him, or not? And that's the test that's put in front of Adam and Eve. I'll give you a rule. If you can obey that rule, there's life ahead. There's a tree of life in the middle of the garden there. If all goes well, that will be your opportunity for eternal life. That's clear. That's the message. We don't have to sort of uh, look too far to see that. So, how do we have pleasure when a child volunteers to help at home or is happy to be obedient, who loves to go along with what the parent asks. That's what God was looking for in Adam and Eve. The one who was, who was willing to uh, make sacrifices uh, and, uh, and not go the way that uh, others would want them to go, to help in the home and to be uh, faithful to parents. Well, that's what God's looking for in Adam and Eve. Would they choose to honour and obey? He's given them everything. God himself never tempts anybody to a situation where they can't do what should be right. God never puts a stumbling block in people's paths. So, so in his own ingenious way, he creates a creature, uh, creates an animal, the most observant animal, the smartest animal in the creation, uh, He's, he's, uh, uh, he's the most subtle, says chapter 3 and verse 1 of Genesis. Most subtle. One of the creatures. Not a human. He's an animal. He's not in the image and likeness of God, but he's one who could speak. Interesting, isn't it? One who could speak and communicate and reason like a human. He's put there in the garden too. This is God's ingenious method of creating an opportunity for Adam and Eve to be tested. He's an animal, he's not capable of morality, he's just got animal instincts, he's not made to, subject to any command of God or any law of God, he's not subject to the law about not eating that tree, I'm not suggesting that he did, but he's not, he's not given laws to obey and he doesn't have a responsibility in that sense of morality. But he's very observant, and he's very clever. Now it had to be that, had to be that way, to introduce the temptation. Uh, and to be clear, as we said, God didn't make him do it, the serpent, but he gave him the ability and he gave him the circumstances that he could do it. Now, the serpent didn't necessarily look like a snake does now because he's punished to go on his belly and slither around as he does now. So it doesn't matter what he looked like beforehand, but he could move around freely in the garden. And, and no doubt he had been to the midst of that garden where Adam and Eve hadn't been yet, and he had seen the two trees there. Adam and Eve had decided not to go there. 
their life was, as we said, guarding around the perimeter. And so the serpent had overheard the command not to eat of the tree. He'd overheard the angels talking among themselves. He knew that they themselves had experienced good and evil sometime in the past. To know good and evil, he says, you'll become like them. And, and so he, uh, he, he, he knew that that was different to Adam and Eve. They were more powerful than Adam and Eve, he could see that. Uh, he had seen the angels make Eve. Uh, he, uh, he'd been present in the garden, all these things are happening. And uh, uh, after all the, other, uh, all the animal, other animals had been rejected, he had been rejected as a partner of Adam. All animals passed before, and that must have included the serpent. No, not an appropriate partner for Adam. He's still animal. His animal thoughts went, well, these angels are all powerful. I've seen and I've heard them. Uh, there's got to be a shortcut to all this power and glory. And the shortcut is eating that tree. So, he comes and tempts the woman. Genesis 3 and verse 2, the woman says to him, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not touch it, neither shall ye uh, not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent comes back with his answer, You shall not surely die. He had no... Uh, compunction uh, of, of going against uh, what God's word was uh, he wasn't subject to God's law he couldn't think like God because he was what we would call an amoral creature so there's no moral thinking there uh, obedience uh, wasn't part of his uh, thinking or makeup. Um, so the uh, woman answers and says we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden now she's already starting to lower the wonderful benefits that God spoke about in chapter 2 verse 16 where he said, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. She doesn't quote that command. It wasn't actually given to her. Maybe Adam hadn't really pressed this idea upon her. We can freely eat. The generosity of God is certainly something that they should have admired and been terribly thankful for but she sort of says well we can eat of the fruit leaves out the idea of freely eating but she says of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden uh, somewhere there we've decided not to go near it uh, ye shall not eat of it neither shall ye touch it now God didn't say don't touch it so they've gone a little bit further that way so we had a reading in Deuteronomy chapter 4 this morning actually where Moses says don't add to God's law and don't take away from God's law. It's also mentioned in other parts of the Bible. So in a way she's taken away from God's law and she's added to God's law. <coughs> so she's already on a track that's uh, going downwards. There's no law against touching the fruit but they've taken away in one instance They've added in another. And then she uses words which are a little different again to the command that God gave. Don't touch it, lest ye die. And the idea of that is in case you die. Which is again not taking God firmly at his word. Where God said thou shalt surely die. She's already starting to have some doubts that are sown in her mind. So They've taken away, they've added, and ultimately the three great lusts which are mentioned in the Bible are awakened. They were dormant, they weren't there, they weren't active at all in the minds of Adam and Eve, but first of all in Eve. What we read is that, as it were, you might say that the servant takes them to the midst of the garden and there are the trees, and there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and she's looking at that. And she sees in verse 6 that the tree was pleasant to the eyes. Well, first of all, it was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes. And notice in verse 9 of chapter 2, that's okay because God made every tree of chapter 2 verse 9 that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So she looks at the tree and she agrees. Yes, this, 
This is one that we could otherwise freely eat. It's, it looks good. Its food is surely going to be good. But then she adds, as the serpent had tempted her, a tree to be desired to make one wise. So in looking in the first epistle of John in chapter 2, which a verse we really know pretty well, in the New Testament, the Apostle John says, these are the three lusts that were awakened at the beginning and they're still active in our makeup now. They weren't before, but now they are, once the transgression has happened. Uh, and, and John says in 1 John chapter 2, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So here's the choice. Are you going to love the Father or love the things of this present being, this present world? And he chooses this path, unfortunately, for all that is in the world. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. You can see it there as she looks at that tree. And a tree to be desired to make one wise, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So what comes upon, she gives of course the fruit to Adam, he involved in the transgression, makes the decision, yes, okay, I I will take it, my wife has taken it, I want to be with my wife, I'll take it. And uh, both of them are clearly uh, making choices that take them immediately away from the closeness they've had with God. What comes? Three things, three things, as a result of the threefold transgression, as it were. Shame. First of all, shame. We read at the end of chapter 2, they were naked and not ashamed. Now they are ashamed because they're naked. And they are fearful as a result. So shame and fear go hand in hand. They fear the consequences. They fear that God will carry out what he said he would do. And in fact, he's going to do just that. So they run away to hide, sewing fig leaves together to make a kind of loincloth that wasn't going to last very long anyway, as the fig leaves would have dried out. So first thing they've done, they've got this shame and they've got a defiled conscience is the second thing. Their mind now has a bias towards things that aren't godly. Their mind now has immediately, sin has entered, has become a bias in their makeup, a proclivity, a, 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 a leaning towards sin and it's a part now of their makeup and the other thing which is obvious is now they are mortal people. They're going to die. <clears throat> God has passed a sentence on them. Automatically, as a result of their transgression, they have become sin-prone and dying creatures who are ashamed now of the beauty and the wonder that God had made them with. So, all these changes change them from that very good state that they had at the end of Genesis chapter 1. Everything was very good. Now, not so. And in fact, they being the head of the creation, they being in charge of the creation, having dominion over the creation, the creation is affected by what happened as well. Thorns and thistles come forth. The woman who would have been easily able to bear children, God says, no, you're not going to be able to bear children anymore in such ease. Pain in childbirth and trouble. And all sorts of issues are going to come upon you now as a result of that transgression. Their eyes are opened. Their consciences have kicked in. They've tried to run away from God, to hide away. And they, can, they hide away in, in the midst of the garden. And, and of course when the angels come searching for them, saying, calling out, they hear, they hear the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in this regular afternoon meeting in the cool of the day that they would have had with the angels to educate them because, as we said, they, weren't, they didn't grow up through childhood. They no, had no prior education. They were innocent till that time. Now, when they hear the voice, and the word for voice there is actually means a loud voice, a fearful voice because God is angry. The angels know what's happened. They don't really need to ask. 
And where are Adam and Eve hiding? In the midst of the garden. And that's not where the angels would normally have found them, would have found them in the perimeter. But now they're in the midst of the garden, as it says, amongst the trees. In verse 8, the word amongst is the same word as in the midst earlier in the chapter and also in chapter 2. So they're in the midst of the garden hiding because they know the angels don't normally come to the midst of the garden to find them, but here they are. And we know that there are certain things that happen uh, that the angels will uh, say uh, are the consequences of what's happened and which will be placed upon the man and the woman for the future, including that they will return to the dust, verse 19. Out of it wast thou taken, dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Now there's, a, there's an issue because they're now in the midst of the garden and there's the tree of life there. And the angels are looking around and thinking, well, we don't want them to take of the tree of life that's here in the midst of the garden or if they take of that and the word uh, in verse 22, take also of the tree of life, uh, the word also appears all there in verse 6 as well, uh, to take and also give to the husband, to also take of the tree of life. Some, some have postulated that they uh, took of the tree of life uh, consistently in the garden to keep them alive. No, this is if you take the same way as you took fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil once and you became dying creatures, the law that God has placed on the tree of life is if you take that tree once, you will live forever. There, that's, they were the what, what are called the uh, associate uh, ordinances associated with those two trees. So they need to go out of the garden and they're driven out of the garden. But before that, they knew that they were naked and they had sewn fig leaves together and God said, no, that's not what I want. That's not good enough. There will be an opportunity for you to be redeemed. I will give you the opportunity of redemption. And the symbol of that will be that you will be clothed upon by a sacrifice that I provide. It will involve the shedding of blood. It will involve the slaying of a lamb. And the skins of that lamb I will clothe you with. Coats of skins, not the aprons, just like loincloths, but coats, and the word means a, a full coat that covers the shoulders and goes uh, well down over the body and over sleeves over the arms, a full covering. And that covering is caused by the slaying of a lamb, which in the book of Revelation we read is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13 and verse 8. And so the lamb spoke of Jesus Christ the great sacrifice for the overcoming of sin and here we have in verse 15 a wonderful promise that is uh, represented in symbol of how God is going to change things and give an opportunity for salvation because when you think about it once they had sinned God really had three choices Three choices. The first choice, I guess, would be he could kill them outright, Adam and Eve, kill them outright, destroy the creation and start all over again. What would that mean? God had failed. He'd failed to produce people who could give honour and glory to him. And the whole thing was a mess and God doesn't fail. So what's the other thing he could have done? Well, he could have turned a blind eye and said, well, um, I just won't, I'll pretend it never happened. But is God just? Would that be a just thing to do? Would that be the right thing to do? Would that be consistent with what we know of God's character? No, not at all. So what's the other opportunity? Then the other opportunity is we will give them time to repent, to change, and ultimately to bring forth glory to God. Give them opportunity. Give them a chance to turn around and come back to him. And so the first thing that is promised is, I will provide a perfect one who will be totally obedient to me, not like Adam and Eve, from the human race. And not only from the human race, not like 
the human race that it was originally created, but even from the fallen human race, I will provide my son. He will be a member of the fallen human race because he will be a seed of the woman, born of the Virgin Mary, as we know. But God will be his father, and he will be God's son. And he will bring forth the kind of perfect obedience that God was always looking for. Verse 15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. The, uh, God says to the serpent, through the angels that are there present, I will put enmity. There will be a battle. There will be a struggle. Uh, there, there won't be uh, peace between evil and good. It will be an ongoing battle between thee and the woman, between thy seed, that is all those who come uh, to the same kind of thinking that you have expressed as the serpent, that God doesn't really mean what he says, between thy seed, the evil people, and her seed, that is, it will be the Lord Jesus Christ, and her seed, the woman's seed, will bruise the head of the serpent, dealing a death blow to the serpent, and thou shalt bruise his heel at the same time as he puts his heel upon the head of the serpent to destroy it, he will be bitten on the heel, which will be a relatively minor wound, and we could see that expressed in the three days in which Jesus was in the grave. Uh, because of, he inherited that same human nature, he, he was subject to death himself. But because he had lived the perfect life, it would only be a temporary blow, and he would have victory over the influence of sin that had continued down through the ages. Let's look at a couple of New Testament quotes just to confirm that message. Over in Romans chapter 5, we read that sin entered into the world, the responsibility of Adam above all, because whilst the woman was deceived by the serpent, Adam knew exactly what he was doing when he disobeyed God, and therefore uh, he must take responsibility for the sin that has come into the world. Romans 5 verse 12 to 15. Not that the woman is totally uh, free of any guilt in this but uh, Adam as we said was to be the teacher and the leader. So it's regarded as Adam's great sin. Uh, Romans 5 verse 12 we read the Apostle Paul saying as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned None of us here, or any of us here, think they've ever sinned? No. <laughs> we haven't, have we? We, we? We're all subject to that problem of sin. It's our makeup now, it's part of our nature. It became a part of human nature from the moment that Adam and Eve uh, took that fruit and transgressed and went against God's law. So all of sin, for, in verse 13, until the law, that is the law of Moses given in the uh, the latter part of the, uh, or towards, uh, partway through the Old Testament, uh, uh, which codified sin and made plain all the different kinds of sin there are. Until the law of sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that are not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. So the one law given to Adam it's not that we have to worry about whether we break that law or not, but now there's a, there's a general decline of moral standards. Now there's a general decline of men's willingness to obey God. And so there are all kinds of sin that develop. Uh, and we're not uh, uh, punished because Adam and Eve um, <laughs> uh, committed a sin and we all commit the same sin. No, it's all part of our makeup now. It's, it's, it's not our crime, it's our misfortune that we have this, this makeup, but it inevitably leads to death in all of us. And even the Lord Jesus Christ inherited that same physical nature, but he never ever sinned. And that's the difference. And God looks to him now as the one who will save the whole human race if they would all come to God in the right way, if we would all believe and trust in him, but that won't be so. But those who do will receive the gift of eternal life that you know, was set in front of Adam and Eve but they couldn't go there so uh, verse 15 reads uh, but not as the offence so also is the free gift God gives a free gift we never earn eternal life 
For if through the offence of one many be dead, much more by the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. So in verse 19 we read that uh, uh, by one man's disobedience, that is Adam's, many were made sinners. We were all constituted in this whole framework of the world which sins. So by the obedience of one. Who is that? Jesus Christ shall many be made righteous. And so in the first of Corinthians, just over in the next book of the New Testament, first of Corinthians chapter 15, there's the hope of resurrection from the dead. We're all headed towards the grave, but the hope of resurrection is there if we come into the Lord Jesus Christ. We are all born in Adam in, a, in, in that sense. We're all part of the body of mankind uh, which began with Adam, and we all receive the results of what Adam did. But in verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 15 we read, Now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man, that is Adam, came death, by man, and this was God's purpose, one from the human race, would be the source of salvation for mankind, by man, Christ, came also the resurrection of the dead, for as in Adam all die, even so all who are in Christ, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and afterward they that are Christ at his coming. And that's why we talk so much about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, because that is at his coming when the great hope of the faithful will be realised. Could mankind produce a saviour savior on his own accord? On his own account, not at all. The human race had fallen. That was impossible. So God wants people who choose to serve him not to be compelled. That's why he didn't compel Adam and Eve to serve him originally. Greater glory if people voluntarily choose to serve God. So it's the woman's seed, Genesis 3 verse 15, not the man's seed, Salvation can only become by one who's born of the human race with all its inherited issues, but also the Son of God, who had the great capacity to overcome, to live a perfect life, a representative of the human race. God allows us to identify with him, to be in him, in Christ. How do we become in Christ? Romans chapter 6 is our crowning quotation because Romans chapter 6 tells us how we can become part of the great salvation that is offered through the seed of the woman from Genesis chapter 3. Romans chapter 6 we read there in uh, verse 3 Know ye not that so many of us as were baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So by baptism we enter Christ, we might say. We are born into Adam by our faith and trust in God, our belief of the things of the truth, and our willingness to commit to God's ways, we become baptised, buried in water, to signify our association with the sacrifice of Christ and his resurrection. We rise from the grave of baptism, we might say, to become new creatures and to walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together, verse 5, in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So we can become in Christ and the curse which came about as a result of Adam and Eve in the garden will ultimately be removed and when the Lord Jesus Christ returns and the faithful are raised and granted by God's grace immortal life to live with the Lord Jesus Christ we will have dominion over the world with him and the world will be changed dramatically back first of all to the conditions of the Garden of Eden and then more glorious still what a wonderful future is in store for the faithful.